The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Welcome to our program. This is Walter Fletcher and with me is John Cathcart. John, we hardly have gotten very deeply into a subject that uh, I think is very important and it's important because we're in the events. Yeah. We are at the door, the Lord's at the door, His coming. And I think as we talk about these literally mm -hmm. earth shattering mm -hmm. events, um, we need to understand as believers that we will be eyewitness to these events of the Lord dealing with His enemies and some of this uh, uh, topographical changes have to do with that. Oh, that has, has to do with it. It's remarkable the changes that are going to take place. In fact, we can't imagine right now what the changes are going to be like, but we can look at certain scriptures. Uh, I can show you from the prophet Habakkuk and from Isaiah, and then I'll go to John's Apocalypse, say three different views of the coming of the Lord. I like that. Three, three, three different views. So let's deal with the, um, with the first view, which is in Isaiah chapter 63. And here's what the scripture says. Who is this that comes from Bosra, from Edom, with dyed garments from Bosra? Now this is the area to the south and east of Jerusalem. South and east, okay. Who is it that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? What do you mean dyed garments? Well, we'll see. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Now the prophet says, wherefore, why are you red in your apparel and your garments like him that treads the wine vat? You know, if you get into a wine vat and start treading grapes, your shirt is going to get dirty, that's right. to say the least. Right. And the answer is, I've trodden the wine press alone, mm. and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled on my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Now, there's a name of the Lord, which is Jehovah Nisai, which means the Lord, my banner. Mm. And if we read Psalm 60 and verse 8 and Psalm 108 and verse 9, we'll see that these Psalms indicate that the land east and south of the Jordan is either going to become burning pitch or go underwater. That's what the Lord means when he says Moab is my washpot. What does oh, that mean? Oh. Moab I is my wondered. washpot. It's right next to the Dead Sea. Oh. See, there are events of flooding and there are events of fire. Okay. Now let's go to Habakkuk and we're going to put up on the screen um, what Habakkuk said and what Habakkuk saw. And so if, if we put that picture up on the screen, you will see the picture that Habakkuk paints of the return of the Lord. So that map shows the view of the prophet Habakkuk. He's looking and seeing the Lord coming from Bosra, or, or from Teman rather, and the Lord comes up that great rift valley, crosses the Red Sea. How do we know this? Because of the things that Habakkuk says. If you read, read the third yes. chapter of Habakkuk, you know, John, I'm thinking also in, in Habakkuk, as you're alluding to the things that he's referring to, you know, Habakkuk was in a quandary oh, man, as to yeah. what God was doing That's while right. he was watching God's enemies seemingly Destroy. trouncing his people and without uh, any opposition. And he goes to the Lord over yeah. these issues and now what you're referring to is God's uh, revelation to him. Well, listen to this. Chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigionoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. 
O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of years, in the midst of years make known, in wrath make known. In wrath remember mercy. Mm. Then Habakkuk says, God came from Teman, and the high one from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And there was brightness. Brightness, his brightness was as the light. And he had horns coming out of his hand. I'll speak about that in a second. And there was the hiding of his power. Mm. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. The earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Now, to locate it geographically, Habakkuk says, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. And if we'll look at the map, you can see where the tents of Cushan are. Mm. And the curtains, or the mountains, of the land of Midian did, did tremble. I mean, there's a terrific shaking going. Then the prophet says, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was your anger against the waves? Mm. Were you angry with the sea that you rode upon your horses and chariots of salvation? Then he says, your bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes. You cleft the earth with rivers. That's rivers of lava. This doesn't the, sound like a tempest on a teacup to oh me. Oh man, the mountains saw and trembled. And the overflowing of water passed by, that's flood. Hmm. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hand on high. The sun and moon stood still, there's Gibeon in their habitation, at the light of your arrows, they went, and at the shining of your glittering spear. Now I can show you from Deuteronomy 20, 32, 34, the glittering spear, the glittering sword is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a person, yeah. it's a man. And you marched through the land in indignation, and you threshed the heathen, heathen in your anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, even for salvation with your anointed. And you did strike through the head of villages and, and walked through the sea with your horses. And Habakkuk says, and, and when I heard, my belly trembled and my lips quivered. No kidding. For almost six decades, world missionary evangelism has been involved in sharing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Going to many places where people have never seen a Bible or heard the Word. Reaching out in other regions where Christians are a small minority. Our native missionaries have fearlessly joined the spiritual battle to save souls and transform lives. Each day, people come to know Jesus through this mission, and they're baptized in His name. Those who are baptized become part of a Christian fellowship that impacts communities and brings light to dark regions. Programs like this prove that the evangelism in world missionary evangelism is not just a part of a name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work. Many people are shocked when they discover that world missionary evangelism has been building, funding, and staffing Bible colleges for decades. These institutions of learning offer those called to preach the gospel and share the good news, an educational foundation to better serve God and man. In the courses taught by experienced instructors, students grow in biblical faith and knowledge, as well as in all facets of mission outreach and work. The tools provided by these colleges help build roads of understanding that enable our sponsored missionaries to reach countless souls. Bible colleges, therefore, are just another example of the fact that the evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work. John, I'm excited with the fact that you're reading these 
different passages that are talking about the second coming of our mm -hmm. Lord. And uh, you've read from Isaiah, you've also read from Habakkuk, great detail in this. Mm -hmm. Um, why do you think that we've got different uh, dimensions of this same description from these prophets? I think because there are two callings. There's a heavenly calling and an earthly calling. Now, I haven't touched on the heavenly yet. Okay. But I will, and I'll show it to you from, uh, from Isaiah. But the Lord is giving a picture for his nation. Well, he's giving three pictures. Okay. A picture for his nation, the Jews a picture for the world Gentile nations. and a picture for the church. Wow. You know, this, wow. Is, this is interesting, but as I get on the internet, why is it that it seems that there is a whole host of people out there on the internet that are fully aware of all this stuff? I mean, this is not unique to you and me okay. and to our view. There are many, many people that are seeing different aspects of this. Let me go to Isaiah. Again, in Isaiah 24, uh, the Lord says, it shall come to pass, talking about these events, that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that comes out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in a snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundation of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Now, if the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, uh, that's global. Yeah. I, I think it's global. Yeah. It, it certainly is local. And he goes on to say, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord, now here we go into the heavenlies. Yeah. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. So now, this is not just the second coming of the Lord to deal with the world of men. Mm. In this second coming, we get God dealing not only with his nation and with the church and with the world, but he's dealing with the heavenly host. Wow. Now, let me show you that that scripture, you'll do with the high ones and the kings of the earth. Let me show you that that's the picture that John paints in the apocalypse in chapter 19. Here's what John says. And I saw heaven open. Now, this is just after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay. Now, I do believe the church gets caught up to the marriage supper of the Lamb but I do not believe the church disappears out of sight, never to be seen or not heard of again. Right, Goodbye, you know? No. <clears throat> After the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Isaiah 64. Isaiah. A vesture dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies which were, which were in heaven, the armies in heaven, hmm. followed him upon white horses, clothed in, white, in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, here we get back to Isaiah 64. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why in his vesture? I believe that's for the church. Why in his thigh? Oh, that's for Jacob. Okay. That's for Jacob, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jacob will know who the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is. And here's what John goes on to say. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Hey, this is some supper. Mm. That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great, Here's, here we get now the host of high ones that Isaiah mentions. Here's what John says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him 
that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, with which he deceived many. And these were cast alive into the lake burning with brimstone, the lake of fire burning. So here John is giving you a picture. Isaiah gives you a picture. Habakkuk gives you a picture. John gives you a picture. Yes. It's all pictures, different pictures and aspects of the same event. And I love, John, you mentioned the fact that, again, and you, you've answered this so beautifully, that these prophetic announcements scripturally show it from a vantage point and they're a message to each group, as it were. That's right. How this, how this is going down, mm -hmm. as we say. I think it was Johnny Cash that said it's going to go by the book yeah, in this yeah. hour. But it's not all negative, and, and this is the thing we have to, to see. There's a negative side, mm. and there's a positive side. Well, when you read about his description, he's called faithful and, and true. true. Who is that for? I think it's for you and I, well, believers, right. to understand what God said is what he meant, and what he meant is how it will be done, and we can take great comfort in that. And you see, here you see a clear picture of two parables, or two things Jesus said, when the disciples said, where will these things be? That's yeah. the end time. He said, wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be to gather together. Mm. That's the carcass of Israel. Okay. And the vultures are the nations round about. But wherever the whole body is, the healthy body, the completed mm. body, the mm. body of Christ, there's where the eagles okay. will be gathered together. Okay. And I think the question is, do you want to be an eagle? You want to be a vulture? <laughs> you want to be a carcass? Or you want to be a whole That's living, good. healthy body? There is the issue. Very good. So what side do you want to stand on? You know, we have the opportunity. We have a choice. And God's calling us to make that and choice. And God today. is calling us to make that choice. And you know, the thing that strikes me is the Bible is packed full of this. Why doesn't the church read it? Mm. Why don't preachers preach it? Why don't they tell the, why don't the watchmen tell the nation, stand on the walls and tell the nation where we're at? Just as it is in America, the key to escaping poverty is education. World Missionary Evangelism has long recognized the importance of education and has emphasized it to the children that we save via our child sponsorship programs and food for hunger programs. We have established schools and these schools provide the basic education these children need to begin to escape the poverty that has ensnared their families, often for generations. What can you do to help us educate children? In many cases, we need new schools. World Missionary Evangelism also needs books and supplies. Children have to have school uniforms in many nations just to attend schools. And of course, there's the need for things like backpacks. How can you get involved? Well, you can call us toll free at 1-800-501-2851. And find out the various costs of providing a child with things like school supplies, backpacks, a desk, a school uniform, or perhaps even an education at a university or college. Once again, that number is 1-800-501-2851. An education builds a bridge between hopelessness and hope. It provides a future where dreams can be realized. It also positions a child to become a leader as an adult, and in that leadership role, lift his family and his country out of the bonds of poverty. You can begin right now by supporting programs at World Missionary Evangelism that emphasize education. John, I'm considering with you the fact of our Lord's second coming, mm -hmm. it involves two feasts. Oh, yeah. One uh, preceding the other, uh, the first one being the marriage supper of the Lamb, which Revelation yeah. 19 mentions there in 7 and 8. And then there is also the second supper, which has nothing to do with believers. It has to do with the Lord's dealing with nations. That's right. In the, in the first supper, which you read about, in uh, Revelation 19, 
It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And then it says, And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, this is a great event. I mean, to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is the catching up of the church to the marriage supper of the Lamb. How long will the supper last? I don't know. Not going anywhere, are we? Not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, we'll stick, we'll stick around. Um, but then you have... So, so you have the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, verses 7 through 10. Then you have the second coming of Christ in glory, verses 11 through 16. Then you have the battle of Armageddon in verses 17 through 19. And I heard a voice, uh, saw an angel standing in the sun, cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. What kind of supper? What are we going to serve for supper? Mm. That they may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, the flesh of those that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both bond and free, both small and great. So the question is, are we going to go to supper or we, do we want to be the supper? <laughs> I mean, that's it. Yes. You know, I think the, the great uh, promises of God. Who would think that we would be at the end of an age and uh, be a part of this as we anticipate the coming of the Lord? I don't know, but you know, I don't believe there's any accident to birth. I really don't. Hmm. I don't think it's accidental. Uh, I believe we have an appointed time on earth. Hmm. And if you are here at this time, it's because God meant you to be here at this time. Okay. You know, I'm thinking of the prophet Jeremiah when God called him to address his people. And, and or I think it was Jeremiah, it might have been Ezekiel, where God says that I, I will, this, this is a stiff-necked people, yeah. but I'm going to make your forehead, as it were, as, as hard as theirs. In I'm other words, flint, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna mate you to fit the hour in which yeah, I have yeah, raised you yeah. up. And I hope, I hope our viewers can hear this, that God gives grace. Yes, he does. And empowers us to walk in the time and the period in which he's given us. That's right. And I think that we need to draw on that in this hour. We should not tremble at the things that the world trembles at. But Jesus said, when you see these events, lift up your heart. Your redemption draws nigh. Lift up your head and rejoice for your redemption draws nigh. No, this is a time of rejoicing for the church. This is, this is not gloom and doom for the church. This is glory for the church. Even though we live in world stress conditions. Even though, you know, the Lord said, fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, fear not. I've overcome them. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that great hymn, John, we don't sing anymore. Maybe it's too convicting, you know. Well, all around the sinking sand, sand on Christ, Christ, the solid rock I stand. We need to make sure our feet are firmly established on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. Your feet are not on the rock, okay? <laughs> um, Zechariah says this, Zechariah 14, talking to the people in Jerusalem. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. Now, I believe the valley of the mountains is that split in the Mount of Olives. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Now, for centuries, this has been a mysterious scripture, but they've got it finally figured out. Hmm. You shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. Mm. Folks, if you are Zechariah. among the saints, you aren't going to be fleeing to the valley of the mountains. Mm -hmm. You're coming with the Lord. Well, modern linguistic and archaeological investigation has thrown some very interesting light on this scripture, which is of great interest to me because of the differences between the Masoretic and the Septuagint texts. Okay? Now, don't confuse the Masoretic text with the original Hebrew scriptures, okay? okay? okay. 
Okay. The Masoretic text did not come into being until after the time of Christ. Here's what the Septuagint says. And the valley of my mountains shall be blocked up, and the valley of the mountains shall be closed up, even to Jesod. It shall be blocked up as in the days of the earthquake, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Hmm. That's Uzziah, king mm -hmm. of Judah. Well, the problem is that a Hebrew word that occurs three times in this verse can be pronounced two different ways. Because in Hebrew, as you know, there are no vowels, there are only consonants. So you've got to know how to pronounce a word. Right. Hence, the vowels must be supplied by the reader and can result in very different meanings. And the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation made nearly a thousand years before the Masoretic text, has the meaning, it shall be closed up or blocked up. The Masoretic text has the meaning you shall flee. So there's a big difference between it shall be blocked up or closed up and you shall flee. Turns on the vowels you use. Mm. Now no writer before the 19th century knew what or where Azel was. Cyril of Alexandria said it was a town, quote, situated at the far point of the mountain. Well, in 1850, a Palestinian geographer, Rabbi Schwartz, claimed that Azel was then, was, uh, which is situated about a half mile southeast of the southernmost peak, the Mount of Olives, uh, called the Mount of Corruption, that that is the place. And we can pick this thought up and what it leads to uh, in the next section of our program. So let us see what we've learned about this place called Azel. There is no doubt that in the developing world, an education separates those who have hope from those who are hopeless. Many children in these impoverished nations cannot go to school because they don't have a school uniform. You can provide a child with a school uniform and shoes and in the process change this child's life forever. You're essentially building a bridge from hopelessness to hope. You can also provide, through a small gift, that child with school supplies. These are all things that World Missionary Evangelism has been doing for generations. And we need you to step forward and help us send more children to school today. To find out more, you can go to our website at www.wme.org. Or to give a gift, call us at 1-800-501-2851.